Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Stuart Rogers. Good afternoon. Ah. Good to see so many of you back. I hope you are refueled. I hope you are fully caffeinated. Um, we have an incredible afternoon available for you. We've got some awesome content, and we're going to get started straight away. Um, we're going to have on stage uh, for an awesome fireside chat the head of Google Cloud Artificial Intelligence, Andrew Moore. And Andrew will be interviewed by CEO of Neurologix, Jaina Eggers. Please give them a warm, warm round of applause. You ready? Uh, no, give me another five minutes. OK. <laughs> I just ran here from the airport, so I, I know what you mean. But these people are uh, just off of lunch, so they're starting to feel drowsy. So I figure yes. it's up to us to wake them up. All right. What Let's do you make think? sure we say at least one really stupid thing. <laughs> well, I'm going to quote you, so we'll start with that. OK. Great. okay? <laughs> It's all, this is, sorry, this is going to be a quote fast because he said so many cool and fun things. Um, so the first thing is, when you and I talked before this, um, you said AI is actually key to human survival. And you have so many people that are saying AI is going to cause an existential crisis. And you really positioned it as, actually, AI is our existential shield. Yes. So I'd love to hear more of your thinking on that and because it's contrary to, to some of our tech community's conventional wisdom. It is. Uh, and clearly, there, there are many ways this could go. But uh, I, I grew up in the age when Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were uh, uh, in power. And I was living in England and really worried that there was going to be a nuclear war every day. Uh, and at that point, I kept thinking, why are we letting humans run the world? Like, why can't machines do a good job uh, instead? <laughs> I've fallen back from that extreme position, but it really is the case that there are some tasks which I, uh, I think that humans and machines working together can keep the world safer than when they're uh, not. So after a large flood, you want to be able to use a combination of people and machines to search for folks who are uh, in danger in the water or in other kinds of trouble. When it comes to uh, things like uh, dealing with the effects of climate change, uh, there are places now, uh, the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon is one of them, that are building giant robots able to rapidly pick up large rocks and start to build emergency levees as a storm comes in. These are the kinds of things which, when you look at the problems in the world, we do have technology on our side to at least help us with some of those problems. You're uh, uh, speaking my language. I um, firmly believe that we make a big mistake in AI when our judgment is the machine is better than the human. Because I think our judge should be human and the machine together are better than anything else. And you see that with yeah. chess. You see it with weather prediction that you brought up. It's just repeated over and over again when we do pair the two. We're very different things. Yes. Yes, and just for the record, I'm not sure if this room would agree, artificial intelligence is still hugely, hugely far away from anything like human cognition or human creativity. Even really simply defined formal questions about what it means to think outside the box. We in the AI world are just infants at dealing with that. But the good news is there are some things especially around perception or detecting patterns or choosing among 10 to the 53 different possibilities, which we can do extremely well. And you've referred to those things so far as artisanal works, which I love that you put that in there. So you think of the craftsman that had the master craftsman that had to be really trained and spend years doing this. But one of the things you want to do, and when you join, rejoined Google, you said, I really want mass accessibility. Yes. And one of the examples you gave of that was a history major at CMU who took an AI course and then did an AI system for uh, American Sign Language 
to help people learn how to better sign. Yes. And so I think that's such a great example of, um, you know, something that's accessible and, and someone that has a passion because I, I think one of her siblings was deaf. Yes. And, uh, you know, that's very accessible to a history major. What other examples do you have of that type of accessibility that excite you when you've seen it? Uh, what, what we're seeing is with tools which make, uh, especially machine learning, easy by automating a bunch of things which us professional data scientists do that folks can get creative. Uh, another nice example was uh, the uh, British Zoological Society uh, really wanted to be able to do accurate counting of critters in uh, different forests, uh, I think mostly in northern Africa uh, and other parts of the world. And they did, they did have cameras which they could put a little bit of compute on. Uh, but they had no real artificial intelligence expertise themselves. And honestly, if we were back in 2010, the way we would have dealt with that is to say, well, let's find a professor and a couple of PhD students to do their PhD on this research question of how cameras all around the forest can, can count critters. What these folks were able to do without having to hire PhDs or any of these things is just give uh, the computer, I think, about... 5,000 examples of images with critters in them and a few tens of thousands without. And then one of the systems we built to automate these things, it's called AutoML, uh, which is a very unimpressive name for a very impressive product, uh, was able to do the data science work of figuring out which is the right model, which is the right learning rate, whether to use a neural network or a decision tree and all of those kinds of things. And now they have the system up and running and it didn't require those years of a PhD or more generally this sort of artisanal approach. I love that. I saw a similar example of um, someone using uh, AI to detect um, illegal logging in the rainforest. Yes. So similar kind of thing yes. where they weren't ML experts at all and use tools like this to enable um, some very simple equipment that they had strung together so that they could detect that faster. Yes. So if you don't mind, I want to, I want to oh, no, please. mention that because that one, that kind of thing is really interesting. And it's part of the, what I'm about to describe, I think, is illustrative of the fact that we're not in a uh, static uh, environment. We're actually in an area where AI is changing every year. So. Uh, Professor Fei Fang used machine learning to help with a similar problem of poaching uh, in big game parks in Africa. And with a combination of drone surveillance uh, and just sending out human rangers, you can try to prevent those. So the first thing she did was learn a system for predicting where the poachers are likely to go. And then the rangers can deploy themselves in those areas. That's machine learning 101. What then immediately happened, as many of you probably suspect, is the poachers realized that uh, the, the rangers were being deployed in smart places, and so they went to the second or third most obvious place. And the machine learning system had a little bit of trouble then because it was getting confused because things kept changing. That led us, uh, or this professor, to use game theory, exactly the same kind of AI that's being used uh, in poker and other things like that, to use the machine learning to come up with strategies which will maximally confuse uh, what's going on. <laughs> so this question of sometimes it's not enough to predict what's the right thing to do using machine learning and then do it. You've actually got to predict what could be done and then take into account things like malicious opponents uh, when, you're, when, when you're deploying it. And I think you're hitting on something really key with these examples, too. So I started in AI in 1989, back at Los Alamos. And we had basic neural net. We had data, because we were at Los Alamos, and we could get data easily. And we had compute power. But we didn't, and we had computer scientists, mathematicians. But what we didn't have is more accessibility. And that's one of the things I also love that you've said is um, that that is actually what's going to drive the innovation is accessibility. It isn't going to be the technology, which, as you said, it's not much different from what we were working on 30 years ago. But that accessibility 
that we've just been talking about is really what's driving that. Can you talk some about what that really means? What, what does it mean when we say accessible? I think, uh, like many other areas, if you watch the life of a data scientist and ask what makes this, this person excited to get out of bed in the morning, it is the meaning of whatever problem they're solving. If it is like identifying potential sex trafficking victims, or if it is uh, helping people have a really good experience when they enter a movie theater, those are inspiring things. There's also some excitement about using machine learning methods. But underneath those really compelling things, there's huge amounts of grunge work. The thing that I think many of us are familiar with is all the work you have to do pre to prepare the data, get it into the right form, join with secondary and tertiary things. That's a pain, and there is some technology which you can use to help that. But there's other stuff as well. One of the biggest problems that this data scientist who wants to be able to launch a useful system has is they got to worry about whether it's going to be able to run safely for the next three years, whether it's going to be reliable, especially if lives might depend on it or there's a large uh, financial uh, impact. So there's all this sort of overhead work that they have to worry about. And so when you picture the life of a happy data scientist and the time when they figure out, wait, 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 I just take the Fourier transform of this one, plug it into the RNN, and I get my result, that's 15 minutes of happiness in her uh, seven-week product of mostly uh, dealing with it. So I can't automate those kinds of mathematical insights that this data scientist had, but I can help remove the rest of all that stuff which is slowing her down. And understand with AutoML which data set matches with which algorithm and things like that so that yeah. people have an easier time of that and they don't have to become expert experts in every type of algorithm. Yes, but I, I want to be cautious not to oversell that because there's still it still requires wisdom from this data scientist to decide what to use out of AutoML. And I completely agree with you there. That's my next question is about expertise. And one of the things that you said is, it's not that the technology um, is, you don't need expertise there. We're always going to need engineering expertise, and that's really important. But where we're really lacking as we think about how we grow AI is in the vision expertise. How, how do we come up with a vision? And so the way I summarize it, because I'm I'm simple folk, is sure. we're moving from engineering be the problem to the problem statement being the problem. Yes. And how do we get good at making those problem statements such that we're not limited by the past and we can still look in the future, but we're grounded in reality? Yes. It's, uh, by the way, I don't have, and I don't think anyone has the, the, the right answer to this yet. So what I'm about, the phenomenon I'm about to describe is something that's I'm passionate about, but do not feel confident about. And it is this. Uh, both in my academic life and in my uh, commercial life, I do have many folks from uh, industries or government organizations coming and describing that they want to use AI for something or there's some problem to solve. And with one or two exceptions, usually after we've been through a successful deployment and I look back at it, the most significant piece of work was the change management from the organization that was going to use this. You can't do massive automation or putting in superhuman abilities in some part of the system without completely disrupting how an organization works. So I think the age of uh, uh, tools providers telling these big companies that have got big business problems. Uh, here, take my tools, you, you figure out how to put them together and you'll solve your problem. That age is behind us. And it will look like, uh, it will start to look like uh, uh, if you're trying to teach someone to play tennis, you say, here, take this racket and these awesome sneakers and you're basically done. That is not the main thing. The main thing is helping an organization figure out how to deal with the fact that it's going to be using more automation and much more uh, insight in its decisions. So let's go a click deeper on the org. So uh, 
three years ago, I actually did a talk called It's the Org Stupid. Very good. And the reason why I had said that is what I was seeing then, and it's gotten a little better now, but still not great, to your point. What I was seeing then in, in, in our customers was what was really hurting them with AI was their org. They didn't have people working together. They weren't um, a team, as we've learned, although not great in, in software in general, having a product manager and an engineer and a designer work together and now a data scientist coming in. Yes. It's that team. What is your advice for who is involved? You know, you talked about the data scientist. Who does the data scientist need to get involved in an org for the folks out here that are getting started that have had those failed projects? I think, and this is going to sound a little trite, but I really, really want to push it. Uh, you shouldn't join a project unless it has got a clear and measurable benefit uh, and really benefit to the world, something that's inspiring and makes your soul want to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, once you've got a goal and it's important enough that uh, other people will share the same goal, it's so much easier to form a team where you're willing to just throw the ball to each other and keep moving forwards towards that goal. If instead you find yourself in an organization which says, right, we're going to introduce artificial intelligence because our competitors have got artificial intelligence, so we need someone to build a data lake and we need someone to uh, go and brand our AI tools or something, something which the danger signal there is it's doing lots of stuff with the words AI, but which is not connected with a specific big business problem, that will be the warning sign. So number one team uh, motivation thing is the, are these strong goals. This is why you see such amazing performance when, for instance, a government uh, will sponsor big AI competitions, uh, very, very clear outcomes. Everyone knows why they're doing what they're doing, and they go for it. Uh, when I've been involved uh, in some of the projects for managing uh, potential disasters or mitigating uh, existing disasters, it's so much easier management task to get everyone working together. So uh, it's, I, I know it's kind of uh, avoiding some of the hard bits of this question, but I would just try to walk away from a project which doesn't really know why it's doing AI. How do you organize your organization at Google? How do you think about that for, you know, you guys are on the forefront. So what could we learn about what you do? Well, I think uh, it actually comes down to the same sense of urgency. I am quite frightened by how many big potential problems there are in the world. And I want there to be millions of people around the world who are able and equipped to go after and deal with them using as much technology as possible. And so we talk about these, that this is the purpose of what we're doing. And then we celebrate whenever we see either that we've helped with solving one of those problems or for, if you like, triple the points when we've introduced a piece of process or a piece of technology which is helping accelerate lots of other people doing it. So again, it comes down to that, what is the thing that really gets us excited? For me, it is this central, central uh, unsolved question of artificial intelligence, which is how does it become routine and something which millions of people can do? That then drives us. Of, and when we get organizational conflicts, things like you know, two groups are working on a project which seems to be overlapping and they're uh, getting worried about each other, uh, you can use the this higher purpose to help sort of de-conflict this to ask how do we make the best use to go after the higher purpose questions. So that higher purpose is often limited by the data we have, the bias that's in that data, the ethics that are involved in creating the system. How do you bring all of those together? How do you think about that? How do you think about enabling other people when you're not ever going to know the data because you know your purpose is to be that tools provider? Yes. So. <laughs> you, you gave me like 15 really <laughs> hard questions, all, all sort of mashed up in a ball of misery there. Yeah. So I'll just... I do that on purpose. <laughs> okay. I was interviewed this morning, and he started off with the question of, why does AI hate women? 
<laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's about 25 different yes. uh, questions wrapped up there. Yes. <laughs> so I feel your pain. Yes, but still it is, uh, this should actually inspire people, I think, to be in the discipline uh, that uh, right now there is this power tool available for the human race, but it has to be used properly and thoughtfully. Uh, while I was uh, a Dean of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon, the biggest question I was getting from my own computer science undergraduates there was, please can you make sure that we have the right uh, ethics education? And this is not, unfortunately there's no such thing as ethics education which teaches you what the right or wrong thing to do is, uh, because many of these actual situations are much, nuanced, much more nuanced than that. But you can educate on how to sort of dispassionately reason about these kinds of issues. I'll give you one example. And in fact, we've been very careful to put in uh, full review processes so that every big AI solution that we're coming up with goes through the review process to, to make sure that we've thought through, even if it looks harmless, all of the is potential issues. One example, it would be really good to be able to use drone footage of a construction site to give warnings if some of the people working on the site are not wearing helmets. It turns out that is a large and important issue in the world of construction, is it's quite easy to save a lot of lives relatively inexpensively by enforcing helmet wearing. So it seems like a no-brainer. The answer is no, it's not a no-brainer because you're then starting to ask a question about a particularly, I would say, sensible and reasonable example of monitoring a workforce to make sure they're following the rules. And I think many of us would, many of us might consider it to be nightmarish to have AIs not just doing things like that for safety, but for other aspects. Uh, and so you do then have to take as many existing ethical principles to work through what you're going to do in these situations where there's a technology which may be useful, but could be misapplied, and go through your toolbook of how to deal with it. So I know I'm, it's not a dramatic answer. It's just, it's another important thing you're doing when you're figuring out a product plan. It comes before something like figuring out the total addressable market or the competitive landscape, is you have to do this question of whether what you're going to produce is something which does uh, match uh, your organization's or your country's uh, uh, principles uh, ethically. So we've been encouraging people to get involved, and hopefully some of this has done that. But I'm going to quote you from about nine months ago, where you said, everyone has to understand AI is very, very stupid. <laughs> Thank you, yes. So, so here we are encouraging people to work with this very, very stupid tool. I'm curious what you would like to see from your organization and or other organizations that would make you either remove one or two of those varies or actually sit back and go, ooh, that was actually clever <laughs> of AI. So I'm curious, just looking forward and let's say nine months from now, what would, what would make you move, remove a very or two? Or what would you actually even go further to say, there's some really clever things going on? What, what's good. going to be released and enabled? So let me, let me begin first with the areas of research. There are a very few people, like maybe I would estimate less than half a percent of all the people involved in AI research are looking at a problem called analogical reasoning, which is, where when we solve problems creatively, uh, we very frequently do say, there's this thing that I did in this other part of my life which worked out, maybe I can apply it here. That's the kind of thing which, uh, seriously, there is no uh, useful technology that I know of. And I, pr I, I spend a lot of time making sure I'm up with technology for helping us do that sort of thing. We should talk about our technology. Okay, very good. <laughs> yeah. So, but in those kinds of uh, uh, things which cognitive sciences, scientists are looking at, uh, and which for many people, including me, seem like old-fashioned AI, the kind of things that people were studying in the late 80s. What, what's going on at the moment in the industry is some aspects of 
uh, classification from video or predicting, being able to do uh, multivariate forecasting extremely accurately, those are so powerful in their own rights, we can do society changing things with them. But that's uh, at best lobster level intelligence. It's nothing like the mysteries of how humans can actually uh, cognate, cognate. Yeah, no, I love that as an example. And I think you're exactly right, having come from, you know, I did neural nets and genetic algorithms and then went to expert systems, which I think is part of some of what yep. you're alluding to. Um, and those were just hard and clumsy and something very, there is a clever key there yes. that I, I'm completely with you on that. So we just have a few minutes left and then we're going to be able to take some questions. Great. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of rapid fire. So you have a huge audience here of people that are passionately interested in AI. Um, some of them are wonderful technologists and some of them are still trying to figure out what their company strategy is. Tell them one to three things that you say are the number one things to get started. Rapid fire. Okay. No prob you've got to know probability theory properly. You cannot fake it with sort of uh, messing around with numbers in weird ways. You have to know what a marginal distribution is and what it means to have confidence in your, in your model. Uh, another, another one, it's not whether you can predict accurately that counts. It's what decisions are going to be made up the line from this model. Uh, seriously, and by the way, I apologize to many people in this audience who know this perfectly well. So this is not addressed to you because you already know this. Uh, it's uh, the loss function that you're using uh, for training. Usually it's not even possible for it to be the same loss function that you're actually using for the decisions. And you have to design that in. Perfect example, uh, something dear to my heart is uh, 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 advertising optimization, showing, uh, the result, showing adverts on web pages using machine learning. Uh, you're trying to maximize how useful they are to the user, uh, because if you show useless stuff, the users will never come back to your search engine. Uh, and that's very different from accurately predicting what's likely to be clicked on. So I'm asked for two things on ethics, because getting started is important, getting people going, and ethics have to be considered, as you said. What would you say are the top two high-level things that you would say to people? There are books on how to have ethical debates, which help you avoid a situation where you're having that debate by polarized people in your organization shouting at each other. Uh, so absolutely go for that. Second thing is, uh, it is an absolute industry trend that uh, third-party customers that are coming to uh, Google Cloud for serious AI solutions, one of the first things they ask for is help on making sure they're following uh, ethical principles. So it's good business to be in this area. That's great. Can we open it up to some questions? Is there anything that you guys want to ask the uh, head of Google's AI, which is Cloud AI, which is uh, the biggest in the world, one of the biggest in the world. We covered all the questions. Nothing is left. Oh, I think we have one. Thank Very you. Good. It's always hardest to be first. Thank yes. you. Oh, we've got two. <laughs> we'll come back, I promise. What would you say the um, most important new cutting edge work is in AI? Uh, it's been around for a lot, but it's just emerging as commercially important is active learning. Uh, the ability to, uh, for, for a machine learning system to decide what additional data it needs. Uh, in fact, that is some of the technology behind our AutoML project. Uh, AutoML, in theory, tries in the order of 10 to the 30 different possible models, but of course it can't actually afford to do that, so it uses machine learning within itself to do this. Uh, if you know how to use active learning properly, uh, I think it can improve maybe 30 or 40 percent of realistic AI deployments. Can we do one more? No. They're not going to let me do one more. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it. I learned it. a Thanks, lot. Everyone. I hope you did too. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, we are going to bring up another amazing chat for you. Um, co-founder and chairman um, and co-founder and chief scientist at OpenAI. Um, they are Greg Brockman and Ilya Suskeva, and they will be interviewed by our very own Kyle Wiggers. Please give them all a round of applause. Okay, how are you guys? Doing great. Excellent. Um, well, uh, Greg, we've spoken over the phone. Um, Ilya, we just met a couple of minutes ago in person. But um, I thought it might be um, wise to start with both of your backgrounds before we get into sort of the history of OpenAI, um, its founding, and sort of its mission. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, that's out. Is that better? Yeah, OK, sorry. I'll um, quickly repeat what I said. <laughs> so I thought um, it might be a good it might be wise to start with both of your backgrounds before we um, jump into OpenAI and talk about OpenAI's history, um, its founding, and sort of um, its core mission. And then we'll also later talk about its current research um, sure. and the work you're doing in robotics, um, video games, as it turns out, and natural language processing. Yep, for sure. Uh, can everyone hear me? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. Um, so my background is, uh, uh, you know, I, I got into it. The, my first exposure to AI was actually reading Alan Turing's 1950 paper called Machine, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, which is the, the paper where he lays out the Turing test. And actually the thing that really excited me about this paper wasn't this amazing idea of that you could actually have a machine that could learn and that could, uh, that could perform tasks at, at the same level as a human, uh, but was actually this piece in there about how we're going to build such a machine. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Turing said is that we're never going to be able to program something so complex. So instead, we're going to have to learn. We're going to have to build a machine that we can show it data, show it the world, just like you would a human child. And then it's going to be able to learn to accomplish these tasks so well. And that idea, I think, really infected me. And uh, the only sad thing was this was 2008. And none of this technology actually existed. Nothing worked. And so I really spent you know, a bunch of time doing a bunch of startups. And you know, I, I was at Harvard briefly, MIT briefly, uh, before coming out to Silicon Valley. Uh, but was always kind of waiting for the time when it felt like this technology actually existed. Uh, and uh, yeah, Ilya is someone who, who actually really started to, to bring this to the forefront in 2012. Yeah, so in my case, I somehow, as a teenager, oh, I think your mic. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mic's not working? It's working. OK. I'm Apologies. Going. An old-fashioned mic. <laughs> yeah, so I got into AI pretty early. I was very interested in math and brains and what am I? And I'm a computer. How can that be? That's very strange. So AI was very interesting. And within that, machine learning, learning specifically, was the really mysterious thing. Because in math, you got the logic, the deduction. But how can you know that the sun's going to rise tomorrow? What's the basis for that? So anyway, I concluded that machine learning is the single most interesting thing. And so I went to grad school. I was in Toronto. Fortunately, Jeff Hinton was in Toronto too, and we started working together. And I was working with him for um, nine years until we made the, our big advancement in 2012. Yeah, and um, so you both co-founded OpenAI, and OpenAI has attracted pretty impressive backers, like um, Reid Hoffman, for example, um, and you know, Peter Thiel, and others. Um, so can you talk about um, sort of why you founded it then? I mean, what is, what is driving you forward? What is the thing um, uh, that you point to when somebody asks, why are you researching this? For sure. Great question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll go first. I mean, for me, there were multiple motivations. Oops. Some kind of Amber Alert or apologies. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, so I had multiple motivations. I was, I was working at Google. I was very happy there, but I felt that I had multiple feelings. I felt that AI is going to be extremely impactful. I thought that AI the, the, no, the notion of AI safety is important, and I thought that a new organization like OpenAI would have a chance to do a truly dramatic advance. And most importantly, I made Greg, and I thought that that this would this would work. Right. And yeah. Greg, I thought um, I'd also like to hear you know the answer to 
question from you, and then also maybe like you can touch on like why um, you decided to found OpenAI as a nonprofit um, and sort of its recent transition to a cap profit, which is an unusual structure. Um, you know, two yeah. questions in one yeah. there. So in 2015, I, I you know almost almost uh, I guess uh, four years ago to the day. Uh, we had a dinner uh, in in Palo Alto, uh, and uh, the, you know four people from from that dinner ended up co-founding this company together. So that was the two of us, uh, Sam Altman and Elon Musk. And the thing that I think kind of brought us all together was a shared vision for where AI technology was going. Right, in 2012, Ilya and his collaborators had really kicked off the deep learning wave, and all of the AI progress that we've seen since then, which has been really amazing, really comes from this one piece of technology that had, had really come on the scene with, with that work. And the question of where, where does it go, you know, is kind of, it's limited by our imagination only, right? And you think about what could happen if we could really build systems that are able to work with people on solving the most complicated multidisciplinary challenges that humanity has to face today, for example, climate change, for example, giving everyone low cost, affordable health care. You could imagine that the impact of this technology would be like un, un, just completely unlike anything we've seen before. And so I guess that we all saw the upside, um, but there's also the flip side, if anything is going to be really powerful, is that you have to ask, well, what are the risks? How can this go wrong? How can we make sure that we're applying the right ethics and that we are building this technology in the right way? And so I think that this dual concern is what caused us to come together and form an organization. And you know, that the main motivation for us is to try to build this technology, which we call artificial general intelligence, uh, and to make sure that it benefits the world, uh, and that that's what all the choices that we make as an organization end up funneling into. And so if you look at the history of the organization, we started as a nonprofit because we didn't really know what the best structure was to actually get the resources, get the people, and to, to really make the technological progress required to achieve the mission. Uh, and then we basically spent the next three years working on pushing forward the technology. We had a number of, of, of really exciting advances, but also trying to answer the question of how can we really get to not just the current level of technology, but really to build the first artificial general intelligence. And I think that the core of that ends up being computational power, right? That if you look at all the advances over the past seven years, that they've been all fueled at their core by this massive increase in the amount of computation that they use. And actually, I think we have a slide that shows uh, the amount of, of compute over time. Uh, if we can put that, that slide up. Maybe the next should be one. The, the, the slide. Yep. So this, this is a, a logarithmic plot. So it looks very linear, uh, but that actually means it's exponential. And so the amount of compute that's been going into these models has increased by about a factor of 10 each year since 2012. And that's a crazy thing, right? You know, like I think humans are really bad at internalizing exponentials. It's hard to really feel it. Um, so one way of, of, of thinking about this, it's a little bit it, just like if your cell phone battery, which today lasts for a day, five years later started to last for about 800 years. Uh, and then you, know, you went to sleep and you woke up five years later, and now it's, it's lasting for like 100 million years. Right? That's the kind of increase that we're really talking about for the amount of brain power going into these systems. If only, um, yeah, my smartphone battery lasts about a day, um, if I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, that's right. right. Yep. It's a great analogy. Um, but yeah, so maybe you can talk about how, like what that's enabling, um, you know, some of the current work that you're doing. As I mentioned in video games, Dota 2, a popular MOBA, as they call it, it's a strategy, online strategy game. And, and sort of, um, sorry, <laughs> yep. one little addendum to that. Um, maybe talk about like the broader applicability of that sort of work. It's not necessarily um, you know, video games that you're trying to you know, master. Um, it builds toward this artificial general intelligence you mentioned a second ago. Yeah, so one way to think about our work on video games is that it combined reinforcement learning with compute. So reinforcement learning, when it came on the deep learning stage in 2013 with the DeepMind Atari work, the games looked, it was exciting, but the games also looked simple. And it didn't really seem like reinforcement learning could do much. And so the way I like to think about our work with Dota is that we've shown that if you simply use a lot of scale with simple reinforcement learning, you can go a lot further than 
anyone at the time has thought. So now anyone will say, oh yeah, of course you can solve games, of course you can solve real-time strategy games. I mean, that's old news. But that's the way we just get accustomed to technology in the same way that we get accustomed to a new version of iOS two weeks after it's installed on our phones. And, but, yeah. And ju just to add to that, so the thing that I think is, is really important to understand is how this technology really works. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, that what the AI sees is just a big list of numbers. You know, as far as the human's concerned, there's a game with a bunch of characters running around that, you know, this game is played professionally by uh, a, a large number of, of people that uh, live together in these gaming houses are very, very intense about this game. As far as the AI is concerned, it's just a big list of numbers. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see that for other work we've done, the AI sees the exact same thing. It's just another list of numbers. And so, you know, another work that, that we did last year was that we managed to have a controller for a robotic hand, which is something that no one had done before. People have spent 20 years trying to figure out how to program these robotic hands to, to perform any sort of meaningful task. And it's just too hard for human programmers. But using the exact same technology, using a system that just sees a big list of numbers and gets a reward whenever it tries things, we were able to both beat the world champions at a video game and also control this robot hand that no one had been able to do. And so this is the real core this is the kind of technology that really sparks the imagination, that you think about what other problems can you turn into a list of numbers that are meaningful to a computer and uh, then allow it to figure out the strategy that is required to maximize reward. And the answer there is, is pretty limitless. Yeah, another one of those problems that um, you seem to be on the way to solving is um, uh, natural language, um, basically generating very convincing uh, snippets of Amazon product reviews, could have been read by human, some of them, um, or just, you know, uh, basically a small, uh, short novella. I mean, um, uh, you know, page long short story. Um, so can you talk about like GPT-2, this recent, you know, natural language model that you um, released um, and sort of like how it's similar and different from this, these other projects that you have ongoing? Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, so what we did with GPT-2 was to take a large corpus of language and then take a very large neural network and then ask the neural network to learn to predict the next character. And we used a lot of GPUs. And that's all we did. And it turns out that, so this is not a new thing. People have been training this kind of neural nets for a long time, but we made it bigger and we train it on a more interesting data set. And those two things led to what appeared to be a disproportionate advance in natural language processing and natural language generation. And I think that an interesting core here is that you know, we basically had been pushing on the same kind of paradigm for about two, two and a half years. And the first successes that we saw were with this, this paper called the sentiment neuron paper where we trained a neural net to play this exact same game. So you're given some text, you're asked to predict what comes next. You know, what would the human write next? And that we saw that when we had a model of a certain size, that the model actually learned a state-of-the-art sentiment analysis classifier inside of it. And this was a surprising thing, because we'd been asking this model to just predict what comes next. And so the obvious things it's going to learn, it's going to learn the spelling of words, it's going to learn where you put a space, it's going to learn where you put a, a period, it's going to learn these very detailed statistics. But this was the first time that anyone had seen semantics emerge. We hadn't told it anything about what these words meant, but somehow it found something that was meaningful. And here's the other crazy thing, is when we shrank the model by a factor of four, this effect totally went away. And so GPT-2 is just the scale up. You know, it's a slightly different architecture. There's different tricks in it. But fundamentally, it's a neural network that we scaled up. And suddenly, we start to see all sorts of, of really interesting behavior that it can actually write these essays that are actually pretty convincing. You know, it wrote this, this essay about why your cycling is bad for the world. And uh, you read it, and it's actually making this argument about, well, the problem is that we're actually generating all this waste in the first place. And so really, we should go, and we should be cutting, looking at the supply chain. And it's actually pretty convincing. Someone posted this on the, the recycling bin at, at OpenAI, you know, entirely written by, by, by a neural net. And uh, you know, when we read that, that, that essay, 
we were like, this has to be copied from somewhere on the internet because you know, that's how the model was trained. And we spent a long time really trying to find it, find some, some forum posting where someone would say this kind of thing, and we couldn't find it. And so somehow the neural net, and you know, maybe it's rephrasing things that other people said in ways that are more sophisticated than we were able to detect, but fundamentally was able to combine ideas and to come up with something that's actually quite convincing to us. Right, um, and that um, is sort of like a natural segue into the explainability piece of your work. Um, so, you know, it's great to have like this really capable model that, um, you know, can generate any sort of text you might want <laughs> or, or understand any text you feed it, um, but how does it work, right? That's something a lot of people would want to know. Um, and that you're not only doing explainability work in natural language processing, you're also, um, you've made significant advances in uh, explainability with respect to computer vision. So maybe you can talk about like uh, activation atlases, this recent project you detailed in a blog post about um, you know, your approach uh, to model training um, that allows people to see you know, which parts of the neural network are uh, inferring things about the data set on which the network was trained. Yeah, so explainability in neural networks is an extremely important question because as neural networks get smarter, we want them to do more things and sometimes they'll make decisions or predictions and we, it would be preferable to understand why they made a particular prediction. And these, new, these neural nets are being so large then it seems that it could be challenging to understand what they meant. And so with our work on explainability in vision models, we've done work where we've been able to understand the essence, that a single, the essence of a single neuron. What is it that a single neuron is looking for? And we've been able to extract those compact, concise circuit diagrams that explain how the recognition of an image is assembled in a human understandable form. And but what I would expect to see longer term as this work advances, is that we'll apply similar tools to language models and models in other domains as well. And ultimately, when we, when we have a model that's, uh, we will use the model's language abilities to explain to us why it made a decision. Mm -hmm. And that will be very useful because then it will tell us, I made decision X for reason Y. So now you know. And I think this is very exciting because there's really this myth that neural nets are a black box. They give us some answer, totally un understandable where it came from. Which, if you think about how humans work, this isn't actually that much better than, than, than we are, right? You can ask someone why they made some decision, but when you actually do the psychology research, you often find that they made the decision for some totally unrelated reason. Um, but I think we can do better with neural nets, and we're, we're really seeing the evidence that we can. And so, you know, again, really the hope is that as we start to have AI be more, you know, entrusted with important tasks in society, that we can understand why is it making the decisions that it is, that we can ensure that it's actually going to do what we think it's going to do, uh, and that we can then ensure that it's actually going to be used to benefit people. And so I think this kind of work is really important. Um, but there's actually a second reason that I think that this work is, is really important, which is, uh, is actually a collaboration with Google. Um, and I think that one of the things that's really important as you bring transformative technology on the scene is that you have cooperation on these axes of ensuring that it's safe. Right? It's good for everyone if car manufacturers coordinate on, on seatbelts. Um, and I think it's kind of good for everyone if, if everyone developing AI coordinates on safety. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I think it's maybe important to mention, and you have uh, detailed it in blog posts previously, but um, uh, that when you released your GPT-2 work, um, you decided not to um, publish uh, the model that is most capable that we've been talking about, the model can, you know, that can generate this convincingly human-like text. Um, and you said you were worried about how it might be abused. Um, so do you think once the explainability piece is there um, and you know, you're uh, working with these models that can basically um, you know, tell anyone who's using them why they made the decision they made, you'll no longer have to be as concerned about that as you are now. Yeah, so I think the GPT-2 release is, is a really interesting case study. Um, because, you know, from, from just kind of where it really started from is that we created a model with capabilities that really surprised us. And that it was hard for us to assess what's this going to be used for? Where are the limits of it? 
And you know, we kind of looked at it. We looked at it. We had an internal process where a bunch of people in the company uh, uh, were involved. And the conclusion from this was there's a bunch of arguments for why it's totally fine, and you know, it's just kind of the incremental progress from uh, from you know what people have been doing. There are other arguments for well, you could imagine this being used to write fake news, and we didn't really try to go and like write the best fake news with it to make sure that in fact you could write awesome fake news. But it really felt within the, the, the sphere of possibility. Um, but I think that the argument that really tipped it for us was that it's kind of a question for GPT-2. You can make reasonable arguments in both directions. But what is so clear is that as this technology progresses, because remember, this was just a scale up of previous technology, we're going to have models where it's super clear that they have dual use implications. They can have amazing applications and do great things, but only if they're used in the right way and that they also could then be used for things that aren't so good. And that as a community, I think that what's clearly missing is an answer for what you do when you have a model of such form. And you really don't want to be figuring this out when you have the super scary thing. Right? You really need to have a dry run. You need to have some test run where if you mess it up, if you accidentally leak the model, if someone gets angry and tries to reproduce it, that it won't have catastrophic effects. And so it was really important to us that we raised a flag for, hey, we have to develop a norm for how you cannot share. And actually, you know, I think we're extremely happy with the results. Right? You know, we've seen, you know, there, was, there was a bunch of controversy, which you know, I think is, is unfortunate, and like, you know, we would have preferred not to have that. Um, but I think it was really necessary for the first time that someone said, hey, we have something we're not sure about, to have that kind of reaction, to let people really you know, let their emotions out. And uh, uh, I think that we learned a lot from it. And you know, what we've seen since then is we've seen uh, several uh, different groups either try to replicate it or replicate it, uh, and also come to a similar conclusion of, let's hold this back for now. We're working with partners now uh, in order to really study the, the, the capabilities and figure out how can you actually use this for fake news mitigation. Uh, and I think that, that these kinds of efforts are really important. And I hope that they're going to set really good precedent for what happens the next time someone has a model like this. Yeah, and just to add to that, it really boils down to machine learning is becoming more capable. And that's it. The more capable it is, the more ways, the more are the good ways, but also the bad ways in which it can be used. And so it just gets less clear. Right. Um, so you said um, there have been a lot of learnings from this release. Um, do you think, I mean, it's difficult to project, but do you think you might approach, once you develop a model like this, probably, you know, which presumably will happen eventually in the future, um, another highly capable model, maybe a computer vision model or uh, you know, a model in some other subfield of AI, you will you know, consider holding it back um, until you can develop safeguards around it. Um, you know. Well, I think it's, it's not really about us in some ways. It's really about community norms. And if you look at the security community, it took them a long time to figure out responsible disclosure. Right? So responsible disclosure, for those who aren't familiar, is the idea that if you have a vulnerability that you've come up with on some vendor software, it gives you a path where you first talk to the vendor, and then if the vendor is not being responsive or doesn't handle it in the right way, you can then go public with the vulnerability. And that the community will look at you and say, you did the right thing. And this is a totally non-obvious process, right? Because you release this vulnerability into the wild where people could actually use it to attack that vendor and do who knows what with it. Um, and it really, I think, took a lot of pain and suffering. And you know, I think that there were various people who were sued and attacked for various things uh, along the way to get there. And I think the security world is much better off. And I think we are all more secure because people went through that process. And so I think that you know, I really view what we did as, as a first step towards helping form community norms. And my hope is that they're now starting to fall, fall into place. And so I hope that, in fact, people will have a better answer for what they do. And you know, I think that there's We've already developed a few, a few extra norms that I think are helpful, like delayed release or engaging specific partners, and then you can go out together. And I think that those things actually mean that it should just be a less big deal in the future when people have models that are kind of, you know, they're uncertain as to their implications. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I want to end on a slightly more upbeat note. <laughs> um, you both have talked about uh, really interesting developments coming down the pipeline, um, you know, the, the current work that you're doing, but you know what really excites you each personally in the field of AI. Um, you know whether it's like the research within OpenAI or just you know speaking more broadly about um, uh, papers you've seen published on Archive. You know, uh, I, I would just love to hear your thoughts. 
Yeah, so the thing I find most exciting is that deep learning has a lot more potential to go, that if you train larger neural networks, they'll do more, and I hope that we'll get them to solve tasks we can't solve right now. For example, I hope we'll get, be able to make some progress in reasoning as well. That would be quite nice. Yeah, so just train larger networks and harder problems. That's what I'm excited about. Um, so the thing that I'm excited about uh, is something Ilya touched on in, in uh, various ways right there, uh, which is a new team that Ilya and I are leading at OpenAI called the reasoning team. And the problem that we want to solve is kind of, to some extent, this question that's been around from, from the day one, which was, is it better to go the symbolic systems route or better to go the neural net route? I think the answer is you need both. And uh, I think that we're really excited to actually get neural nets that are capable of reasoning and, uh, and solving tasks they can't today. Yeah, outstanding. Well, I look forward to reading about it soon, I'm sure. <laughs> well, thank you both. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, hey, we've got another set of showcase companies coming out for you. Uh, they're going to have five minutes each to show you the latest and greatest artificial intelligence technology. Remember, these are not sponsored. No money has changed hands. No Bitcoin has changed hands. No Facebook in-app currency called Libra has changed hands. Um, we have uh, just picked these people because they've got incredible technologies. Um, the first one we'd love to bring out from Mesmer, uh, co-founder and COO, please welcome Ahmed Datu. Give me one second while I set up. So hi, everyone. My name is Ahmed Datu. I'm the co-founder of Mesmer. And Mesmer uses uh, RPA to radically change the way developers work. We call this RPA for development. So the future of software testing is developers and software robots, or bots, working hand in hand. The idea is that the bots do the grunt work, the developers do the fun work, like writing new features, learning new technologies, or just simply eating donuts. By the way, shameless plug, we're giving away San Francisco's best donuts at our booth, so definitely swing by. Um, so what's the grunt work that the bots focus on? We call it customer experience testing. These it's about finding, proactively finding the kinds of bugs that customers will notice and complain about. Today, this is done manually, and it consumes about 40% of a developer's time. So why should you care about uh, what, what are the types of things that customers are complaining about? So we analyzed one of the most popular Android apps out there, and we analyzed the one-star reviews. And 40% of the complaints referenced bugs followed by UX issues, followed by performance issues. These are things that a bot should automatically be able to find and easily be able to find. This is low-hanging fruit. So why should you care about some poor reviews? It turns out that the App Store ratings matter. So you drop one star in your App Store rating, and your customer churn increases by 50%. That's right, 50%. So you should care because it has a material impact on your business. So how are we using AI to solve this problem? So our bots use a proprietary technology we call deep learning automation to perform over 10,000 skills. So for the geeks in here, we use computer vision to actually recognize all of the UI elements on a page. 
just like a user would. We use natural language processing then to analyze the text on a page to understand the context of the page. So in this instance, the bot would realize that based on all the text that's on this page, it is a login page. And then we use path planning models to have the bot interact with the application just like a customer would. So, you know, first entering in an email, then entering in the password, and then only clicking the login button. Ready for a live demo? I think I'm tempting fate by trying to do this live. So can we switch to my monitor? All right, so what I'm about to show you is um, our AI-powered bots basically automating all aspects of customer experience testing from beginning to end. The app that I'm gonna demo is the Coffee Bean application. They're a competitor to Starbucks. What you're about to see is the bot will connect to the CI CD system, identify that a new bill is available, spin up a mobile device in the cloud, install the application on that device, configure that application, then go through the process of autonomously crawling through the application just like the user would, except it's looking for bugs. So what you're about to see is all of that at day zero, where there's been no training, no involvement from anyone on the development side from Coffee Bean. So, you can see the bot start to crawl through the application, going through the various screens. It'll eventually get to the login screen, enters in the login credentials, and will go through the process of doing things like ordering a cup of coffee, paying for it with a gift card, um, going through the checkout process, and even try to call a Coffee Bean store doing all the kinds of things that a user would do. The bot is autonomously crawling the application, mapping all the customer flows, and also identifying, highlighting, what's changed or what's new, which is marked by the purple squares around the screens. It generates an app map of your application, which you can use to better understand how your application works, or you can use it to verify the design um, validity of the different screens in your application. So what are the kinds of bugs that the bot will find? What are the kinds of customer experience issues that it'll find? It will detect those kinds of things that a customer would see, like the application crashes, um, the features are broken, UI-related issues. So all the things that a customer would notice and complain about, and I'm about to show you one of those. This is the checkout flow of the Coffee Bean application as you go through the process of ordering ahead. And you can see all the different steps that were part of this particular flow. And some of the screens are red, indicating that there was a problem with this checkout flow. And I can go ahead and click on it, and you'll see that on this page, the bot expected a cup of brewed coffee that looks like this, but the image is different. There's a problem with a content management system. This is the level of detail that the bot is able to identify. And by the way, for those of you who hate documentation, who hate filing bug reports, bots love doing it. The bot will actually file the bug report for you, providing screenshots, device log files, everything that the developer needs to reproduce the problem. So if we want to flip back to the slide deck. Let me just conclude with a blank screen. Let me just conclude with why where we started, which is the future of software testing is really about developers and bots working hand in hand. And using Mesmer, you can deliver five-star applications significantly faster, and along the way, enjoy lots of donuts. See you at our booth. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, bringing up our next showcase uh, from Aperture Data, please welcome the founder, Vishako Gupta Kledat. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the phone. I don't have the clicker. There we go. My time starts now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I'm Vishaka Gupta. Uh, before founding Aperture Data, I was at uh, Intel Labs where I led the design and development of VDMS, the Visual Data Management System, which forms the core of our product. Our company is going to offer an on-premise and SaaS version of the Aperture Data platform an end-to-end -end visual data management platform for scalable machine learning. Machine learning, specifically deep learning, has seen tremendous improvements in compute efficiencies and accuracy of identifying content. 
But often these improvements have been shown on per use curated data sets. However, as more and more enterprises adopt machine learning as their method of understanding data and uh, improving business efficiencies, real data is going to be the next big challenge at every stage of their machine learning pipeline, starting from collection, curation, to actually extracting these insights. What we know is that 80% of data flowing through the network is visual, like images and videos, and it's poised to keep growing given the increasing deployments of cameras um, in various sectors. Now, um, images and videos can be large in volume and individual sizes. However, they carry a lot of rich metadata and uh, they can be used to extract business insights. Naturally, enterprises uh, hire, uh, want to hire data scientists and machine learning experts who know how to create workflows that can help them extract these valuable insights. But as more and more organizations are realizing, and as has been talked here today, it's really difficult and expensive to find these experts. Worst is that after you have deployed these teams, they end up spending months of their valuable time in figuring out and navigating through the complexities of uh, managing or engineering the data and metadata that has been dumped by various, uh, various visual sources before they can start turning and extracting gold out of it. And this happens for every problem they're asked to solve. Now, given the scale of machine learning deployments, this can mean millions of dollars of lost productivity and efficiency for these corporations. Um, now, imagine a data management system that could unify uh, the storage and access of data and metadata in an AI-friendly and easy-to-use manner such that, you can search, such that you could search for whatever you want whenever you need it and get it in a format that you needed it. That would mean months of save time for these teams of experts and uh, a saving of millions of dollars for the corporations. So Aperture Data Platform accelerates deep learning by addressing how visual data is managed. Let's walk through a, a concrete example where a company wants to monitor whether the workers are wearing regulatory helmets. Uh, construction zones are typically, you know, they have cameras that stream videos. You could label uh, the frames that, keep, can, that contain workers with, you know, whether they are wearing helmets or not using machine learning. So the next task, would be to figure out where do you store this information about workers and their helmets, and given the varied set of options that you see at the top there, uh, it would take you weeks to just figure out um, which database or which format is the right one to store this meta information. Now the next step would be to figure out how do you store the data? How do you stream it uh, so that you can see what is going on? Even if you use one of the cloud vendors, it would still take you weeks to set up, and, uh, and it would just be a point solution. Whereas, and you know, that leads to really frustrated experts. Whereas with Aperture Data, you could just start by uh, ingesting data as it comes along, store the data and metadata along uh, as it is streaming in, um, and after you have, you know, as you keep collecting this data, you could ask for, okay, now give me uh, the images that have workers without helmets. Let's say you start off by asking them in the original resolution. And then you could choose to maybe change the resolution because you wanted to display thumbnails. And all you had to do was change a little operation and you would start getting thumbnails. And this is not all. Aperture data, doesn't Aperture data Platform doesn't just manage your images. It goes beyond to manage videos. It understands bounding boxes. It understands uh, content-based searching. So you can actually get started in this example to, to look after you know, if your workers are being safe or not immediately without wasting much time. And these benefits, this was just one example, these benefits extend to other domains too. For example, a retail customer could use uh, Aperture Data Platform to ask questions about uh, shopper behaviors. Uh, a medical imaging AI customer is uh, using Aperture Data Platform to store patient information and brain scans and the segmented tumor information to help medical ex uh, experts. And the benefits, uh, and you know, the domains can, uh, th this goes on. This picture is just to give you, the, the left side is just to give you uh, 
actually wait, that was the right side, uh, is just to give you an idea of uh, or a glimpse into what Aperture Data adds on top of the open source visual data management system, which is shown in white. Uh, the thing on, on the other side is basically the, the quantitative upsides of using our platform in terms of improvements to productivity, performance, and scale. Uh, and this is from a very early customer prototype. To conclude, as, as machine learning becomes, uh, what, what has been overlooked so far is that as machine learning becomes more universally deployed, managing the onslaught of real visual data is going to be a killer for uh, scalable machine learning applications. We created Aperture Data to make sure that managing and accessing images, videos, and associated high dimensional data was never gonna be a bottleneck for this next generation of machine learning applications. I'm happy to announce that today we are opening our uh, pilot program for more uh, for customer pilots with Aperture Data Platform. Uh, we are working with a couple of customers and we would like to, and we hope to get a few more partners. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving things right along, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Spoke. Please welcome to the stage, Jay Srivanasan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Srinivasan, co-founder and CEO of Spoke. Uh, we're a modern ticketing system built for today's forward-thinking companies. Um, and when I talk about ticketing, I mean uh, internal requests within your organization, IT requests, HR requests. But before talking about ticketing, let's actually spend a uh, second on this notion of uh, what we call the on-demand workplace. And I'm going to try to get this clicker to work. There we go. Um, so before ticketing, here's why we built Spoke. In the last five years or so, in, your, in our consumer lives, we've gotten used to on-demand services. Um, we don't order a cab anymore, right? We use Uber or Lyft. Uh, we don't go to the mall anymore. We use Amazon Prime. We probably don't call a restaurant and order delivery. We use an app. And the common feature to all of these um, on-demand services is immediacy, it's convenience, it's personalization. And what happens is consumers who are used to these experiences, they come to work the next day, and they expect the same thing from their IT colleagues, from their HR colleagues, from their office colleagues. And so that's what we refer to as the on-demand workplace. And in the on-demand workplace, Nobody wants to file tickets in a portal anymore. They don't want to go to a corporate internet, fill out this long form, and then maybe receive a response two days later. And so that's why we built Spoke. So the first thing about Spoke is that we focused on modern design. The way we've built Spoke, it looks like this. It's super easy to use. It still has all the power of a ticketing system, but it's fast, it's responsive. Anybody in the company can use it. And the thing is, your end users, your, your colleagues, aren't even going to go into the ticketing system. In the on-demand workplace, when they need something, they're probably gonna to go to something like Slack. So let's look at this GIF. Jordan here, um, he has a quick HR question. He's not gonna create an email. He's not gonna fill out a form. What he's gonna do is talk to his friend Sam in the HR team and ask her how to change his address. Now here's the thing, Sam's getting 100 of these requests all the time. And in the on-demand workplace, what she can do with Spoke is click a button, Spoke understands the question, automatically responds to Jordan, he gets the response, right? This is what ticketing in the on-demand workplace looks like. And the cool thing is, if you build a system that's super easy to use, it's not just used by IT teams, it's not just used by DevOps teams, it can be used by marketing, product, facilities. And so in fact, something like 80% of our customers use Spoke across more than two teams, 25% of our customers use Spoke across more than five teams. So one part of the on-demand workplace ticketing experience is design. The second, of course, is the, the AI or the machine learning component. So we've been working on this for three years, we have probably one of the best ML models for workplace requests. And essentially, one of our core innovations is we spin up a private self-service deep learning model per customer, and then it's continuously learning as the tickets are actually going through the system. And because of that, we're not only, not only able to respond automatically, but we're able to personalize experiences, because that's the need of the on-demand workplace. So let's look at these two screenshots. Jordan in the San Francisco office and Isabel in the Rome office asked the exact same question, how do I change offices? Spoke recognizes who's in what location and provides the appropriate personalized response back to them. So for Jordan, how to move offices in the US, for uh, Isabel, how to move offices in Europe. Because of this, up to 50% of all of our requests from our customers are automatically resolved. But here's the thing, what we're like super excited about, the next phase of Spoke, is 
Half of the time when you're contacting your IT folks, your HR colleagues, it's a knowledge request. The other half of the time, it's actually a service request. You need their help in getting something done. And this is what service requests look like right now. It's basically incredibly archaic, cumbersome, long workflows with approvals. Nobody knows how to actually get stuff done. This is what workflows and service requests look like in Spoke. Incredibly intuitive, natural language. You write out the steps that you want done, and you tell Spoke who should be working on what. Let's actually see what this looks like. So Jordan, again, he has a lot of problems today. So Jordan is going to Spoke again, and this time he's saying, look, I got a phishing email. And Spoke is recognizing that this is not a knowledge request, it's a service request, sending it to the InfoSec team, asking Jordan whether he opened the mail and if there's something wrong with his computer, and automatically creating a ticket with the InfoSec team with these responses, and it's even telling Jordan to forward the email to the phishing alias. This is what a service request automated in Spoke looks like. Here's what the InfoSec team sees. Super easy interface. They have all of the context about this ticket, including the questions that Jordan has answered, and then Spoke automatically tells them what tasks to do, like enrolling Jordan in a phishing training program, and they respond back to Jordan immediately, right? Spoke is doing all of this automatically. Here's the thing, in the on-demand workplace, Jordan doesn't want to come to the ticketing system, so he's gonna get the response directly back in Slack. So, in summary, basically, we automate repetitive knowledge requests, but now we also recognize when a request is a service request, who it should go to, what questions you should answer, and what workflow to automatically create. If you'd like a demo, uh, please check us out at askspoke.com. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up from Connecticut, please welcome Chief Product Officer Irina Farouk. Thank you very much. So as many of us are acutely aware, and the reason we're here is that enterprises are looking for ways to use data to reinvent the way they interact with their customers and the way they optimize their business. But they're using machine learning to shorten the drug development cycles in pharmaceuticals, integrating self-driving technology into, to improve the driving experience, or telcos moving to adaptive network coverage based on where people congregate. In order to make this transformation, we have to make a shift from passive to active analytics. From looking in the rearview mirror to trying to understand what happened in the past to making decisions in real time in the context of historical information, using machine learning for predictive analysis and having a deep understanding of human and machine connections. But today, this transformation has challenges. And some of the early pioneers have had to dedicate significant time and resources integrating a hodgepodge of different technologies that were never designed for active analytics in the first place. The good news is no more. Not with Kinetica, the next gen platform for data-driven applications. The Kinetica platform has been purpose-built for active analytics, combining streaming analytics, historical analytics, location intelligence, and machine learning in a single platform. The word unified is really, really important, as all of these capabilities are tightly integrated to provide developers with a seamless experience to build this new class of application. As our mission is to serve the world's largest enterprises, we have put a lot of thought into the architecture of the product. The Kinetica platform is cloud ready and GPU accelerated, some of the keys to our abilities to do analytics at such a massive scale. Let's take a look at a couple of applications leveraging the Kinetica platform today. 5G is poised to become one of the biggest network advances changing our lives in ways we cannot yet fully envision. In order to effectively plan 5G rollout, telcos need to analyze and model their network coverage. Before Kinetica, with the best technology in the market, it would take network analysts and data scientists days or weeks to model a single neighborhood. It would have taken them years to analyze the entire network coverage. With Kinetica, some of the world's largest telcos are analyzing their network coverage in minutes, dramatically accelerating the development and improving the accuracy of their network coverage models, laying the foundation for predictive modeling of 5G and mitigating a significant amount of risk. 
Speaking of risk, how about risk management and finance? With billions of trades happening every single day, each with the potential to materially impact the risk of your portfolio, doesn't it make sense to calculate your risk as the market signals come in? However, in most of financial institutions today, risk calculation happens as a batch process overnight, or at most twice a day, before trading begins and after trading closes. With Kinetica, some of the world's largest financial institutions are calculating risk in real time as the market signals and internal trading activity streams in. Now the director of risk has a real-time view of the value at risk of their entire portfolio and is able to take immediate action as they see market activity that dramatically increases risk exposure. This is only possible because of Kinetica's unique architecture, where streaming and historical data is analyzed together and machine learning models are run continuously as the market signals come in. And of course, we would be remiss to be at an AI conference and not to mention autonomous vehicles. AVs represent the holy grail of safe and reliable transportation, but they also represent the ultimate challenge of managing data and AI across edge and cloud, the challenge Connecticut is uniquely positioned to address. Today, for the first time, we're showcasing some of our work we're doing with the world's largest auto manufacturers to help them on their journey to level five autonomy, from analyzing large volumes of AV field data at the edge to aggregating and visualizing for macro insights in the cloud, to then pushing the refined models back to vehicles for continuous improvement. This was just a speed round overview of some of the amazing ways our customers use our technology to transform their business. We've got many more stories to tell, and we'll be at the booth and the session this afternoon if you'd like to learn more. Thank you very much. Wait, 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 wait. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Irina. And last but not least, uh, let's have a warm round of applause for the CEO of Inference, Callan Shabella. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll just get these slides in order here. Uh, my name's Callan Shabella. I'm on stage here with, uh, Infer uh, with Richard Demar. He's going to help us with the demo in a few seconds. Uh, Inference Solutions is an intelligent virtual agent platform. Uh, if you're wondering what intelligent virtual agents are, we basically automate interactions between businesses and their customers or between businesses and their employees. The uh, slides have got a mind of their own, so they're just racing away. The, uh, we recently announced as uh, having global uh, market share leadership, uh, over 300 uh, enterprise deployments around the globe. Uh, we essentially help you deploy self-service applications. So we are not an engine company. Uh, rather, we operate an abstraction layer, uh, a drag and drop environment where you can basically consume the best cloud technologies that are out there, uh, including some premise-based technologies as well within our licensing environment and do so in a drag and drop environment. We like to think of intelligent virtual agents as being very much like working with an outsourced call center. Um, sorry, this is just going crazy. I'll just ignore the slides. Uh, like an outsourced call center, except that there are no people. So you basically lease an intelligent virtual agent just like you would somebody in a call center, a call center agent. And we do that now on behalf of hundreds and hundreds of enterprises across the globe. There's lots of their logos there on the screen. Pretty much any industry you can think of, whether it be Fortune 500, government, all the way down to small and medium enterprise, can be handled with uh, intelligent virtual agents today. Tomorrow we have a special case study on the stage uh, with Pizza Hut, uh, which are using intelligent virtual agents throughout the organization. Just gonna switch clickers for you. Is that, is that the wrong yeah, clicker? So green button. If you want to take back. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Garner's tipping the intelligent virtual agent marketplace, the economic value delivered by virtual agents, to top $1.3 trillion by 2030. There's not that many trillion dollar markets, and obviously 2030 is a while away. Uh, but even uh, two years ago, uh, agents represented 43% 
of the total AI market value. So it really is the largest segment uh, for artificial intelligence. All right, what we're gonna do now is actually just quickly show you Studio in action. So you can kind of think of Studio as the glue that holds everything together. On the left you have all of your channels, so your voice channels, your messaging channels, uh, or your telephony transit coming in uh, to Studio. We combine that with our licensing cloud, our API interconnects, so whether you want to consume some, some IBM Watson, whether you want to consume some uh, Google transcriptions, some uh, Google WaveNet, some NLP, whatever it might be, along with a whole range of fulfillment tools because the average user of, a of the Inference Studio platform would not really describe themselves as technical. Uh, rather, they have a good understanding of their contact center environment or their business environment, and they really need these fulfillment tools to allow them to achieve whatever real-world outcome is that they need. So today we're announcing uh, support for business WhatsApp. So WhatsApp has uh, been releasing their APIs gradually over the last few months. And you can now bring your WhatsApp number to the Inference Studio platform. And what we're going to do is switch out over here to the demo screen uh, that Richard will be driving. And we will show the actual building of a WhatsApp uh, bot you know, in, in real time. So this is the Studio interface. Uh, we can create tasks on the voice channel, messaging channel, or the workflow channel. Uh, WhatsApp API support today is really on the uh, messaging side of things. So we go into our messaging tasks. These are tasks that we've allocated to our virtual agent pool for them to perform. And we've created a very simple uh, demonstration here for VentureBeat. You can click on that. And you can see here that we've actually got a drag and drop editor. If we look on the left hand side, uh, we can see all the various nodes and building blocks that you can use to basically pull together. So this, this actual demonstration here we built this morning, it's combining some simple keyword spotting, but as well as uh, an NLP fallback. So it's actually going out to Google Dialogflow and allowing to have a real time interaction uh, with the system. So this interaction's been designed graphically here on the screen. If we switch out to that WhatsApp tab, uh, Richard, we can start interacting with it. So if we say something like, hi, uh, you'll see the bot respond. And we might ask a question like, uh, can you tell me a little bit about uh, Inference Solutions? So there we go. Hi, this is the uh, Inference Solutions WhatsApp bot for VentureBeat. How can I help? Tell me about Inference Solutions. And we'll see that. And we can start integrating content from our website. Uh, so if you say, tell me, uh, tell me about Studio or something like this, we can start being sent brochureware and all the usual stuff you'd expect to see uh, in a chatbot environment. But we could also do this in the voice channel, we can do this in a workflow channel, and we can switch between them uh, pretty much seamlessly. So if I now go back to the studio interface and I'd like to build, say, a new task in the voice channel, I can go up to tasks, create a new voice task, and this time we'll actually use the task library, and you can think of the task library as kind of like an app store. Uh, these are tasks that other users have published, and we can just use these tasks as a starting point for our intelligent virtual agent experience. So if I search for something like natural language call steering, there it is there. So this is something that someone else has published. Click on that, click on next, and fill in our name. You'll see that just in a few seconds we can publish this to whatever uh, telecom platform of choice that we like. There's over 35 to 40 resellers of this platform around the globe, so pretty much any, every region in the world is, is covered. And there it is, there's a, a full NLP powered voice task uh, for voice agents. If you'd like to see this, we're out of time. If you'd like to see this uh, uh, demonstrated live in our booth, please come and see us on the show floor. We'll see our case study tomorrow uh, with Pizza Hut and Hulu on stage. Thank you. Thank you guys. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, that concludes our showcases for this afternoon. Uh, next up, we disperse. Um, you can come back in here uh, for the, the business AI. Um, we have, of course, around the corner, uh, the Conversational AI Summit. And that is going to be absolutely chock full of awesome content this afternoon. So head around the corner. Uh, you want to go to uh, number six around there, Conversational AI Summit. Um, look out for that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, go and enjoy uh, uh, some coffee. Uh, we want to get you into Conversational AI at 3.30. Um, and in here, we start at 3.45. And of course, in all the other stages as well. So please go grab a coffee, uh, get what you need, and we'll see you on the other stages very soon. Thank you so much. 
Hi, my name is Callan Shabella. I'm the CEO at Inference Solutions. Inference Solutions is an intelligent virtual agent platform. We automate interactions between businesses and their customers or between businesses and their employees. An intelligent virtual agent is very much like a human agent in a contact center. But unlike a human agent, an intelligent virtual agent never takes a break. It works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and costs just a small fraction Darling, of human agent cost. Darling, there you go. Uh, I'm gonna get like no time. Don't, don't, make, don't make my microphone hot. Phone usage defines user behavior. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get no time at all. Imagine if you could predict customer um, behavior based on data minutes. flowing through the telecom network. Phone use eye carrier well, technology extracts to... live phone usage data from the heart of the telecom network. We apply AI to understand customers and predict their behavior in real time creating a whole new world of commercial applications. PhoneU.com great experience as a customer it felt like you really mattered but the norm disjointed conversations questions unanswered valuable time wasted now there's a way to make every experience matter bold 360 helps you remove the roadblocks and dead ends creating a personalized connection with the customer every step of the way and your employees are always backed by AI letting them be more responsive and human. Bold 360, make every experience matter. Hello, humanity. Recognize this place? This is our home, the universe. Humans are more powerfully alive than ever before. We are more alert and energized with vast oceans of data at our fingertips. More intelligent than ever because our machines of industry transportation, health, and safety are more intelligent than ever, too. And we're right on the doorstep of breakthroughs once thought unimaginable. Smart cities, flying cars, and Hypergiant will be the ones to take you there today. Because Hypergiant is not waiting for tomorrow to get to tomorrow. Hi, my name is Callan Shabella. I'm the CEO at Inference Solutions. Inference Solutions is an intelligent virtual agent platform. We automate interactions between businesses and their customers or between businesses and their employees. An intelligent virtual agent is very much like a human agent in a contact center. But unlike a human agent, an intelligent virtual agent never takes a break. It works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and costs just a small fraction of what a human agent would cost. Phone usage defines user behavior. Imagine if you could predict customer behavior based on data flowing through the telecom network. Phone Use Eye Carrier technology extracts live phone usage data from the heart of the telecom network. We apply AI to understand customers and predict their behavior in real time, creating a whole new world of commercial applications. PhoneU.com. great experience as a customer. It felt like you really mattered. But the norm? Disjointed conversations, questions unanswered, valuable time wasted. Now there's a way to make every experience matter. Bold 360 helps you remove the roadblocks and dead ends 
creating a personalized connection with the customer every step of the way. And your employees are always backed by AI, letting them be more responsive and human. Bold 360. Make every experience matter. Hello, humanity. Recognize this place? This is our home, the universe. Humans are more powerfully alive than ever before. We are more alert and energized with vast oceans of data at our fingertips. More intelligent than ever because our machines of industry, transportation, health, and safety are more intelligent than ever too. And we're right on the doorstep of breakthroughs once thought unimaginable. Smart cities, flying cars, and Hypergiant will be the ones to take you there today. Because Hypergiant is not waiting for tomorrow to get to tomorrow.